All right, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Philip Matthew. I'm part of the uh, uh, committee to help um, organize this. Today we have for our fireside chat, Dr. Lisa Rohan. Uh, Dr. Rohan has done extensive experience with drug delivery, HIV, and uh, COVID prevention. And so she's going to talk a lot more about both those topics, uh, as well as her experience joining Pitt Pharmacy today. So uh, without any further ado, I'll uh, let you go ahead and go. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today to talk about some of the work. Of course, I, I present our work on behalf of all uh, my laboratory at and my research group that I work with, I'm very lucky to work with a fantastic research group and I enjoy working with them. You'll see some of their pictures in my presentation. I'm gonna share my screen if I can. Are you able to see this? Yes, it looks good. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, so I was asked to start with a little bit about you know how I came to Pitt Pharmacy. So so let me just start there. So my my background actually my undergraduate work was in chemical engineering. I got my bachelor's of science in the in chemical engineering. During my um, undergraduate training, I actually worked in a laboratory where they were working on um, developing media that could use, be used to, to uh, transfer organs for transplantation. Um, so it was, a, it was a drug transport lab. And that's really where I first got my love for working in a research lab and doing research projects. After I graduated with my chemical engineering degree, I actually went to work as a process engineer with Mobile Chemical in their packaging coatings division and very quickly learned that I, I wasn't so enamored with chemical industry. But luckily, very rapidly, I got recruited into the pharmaceutical industry. And so I joined um, Sterling Drug up in New York as uh, a research scientist in their novel drug delivery group. And as part of that group, I got opportunity to work with a, with a number of different dosage forms, both over-the-counter and prescription drug products in the clinical and manufacturing across all areas of product development and really got a wide range of experience. I really loved my experiences at Sterling Drug. Um, but as drug companies evolve, um, Sterling then became um, acquired by Kodak Pharmaceuticals, who then got acquired by Sanofi Pharmaceuticals. And at that point, I thought, well, maybe it's time to try something else. So I went um, to a company called Biodecision Laboratories and was recruited back to Pittsburgh. And Biodecision was a company, it was a contract research organization that did clinical trials um, a lot for generic, but early phase um, cl clinical trials for first in human studies. And so my job was actually started out to be the translational person to help people to get over the hump from the bench into the clinic and to work with some of the customers. So I worked with Bristol Myers Squibb, all the big pharmaceutical companies, as well as smaller pharmaceutical companies and, and a range of different organizations across really around the world. Um, through that experience, I actually also at one point became director of even a marketing department. So had it increased my experience across uh, different areas. But what I found was I was getting further and further away from the science. So for that reason, I went, came to the University of Pittsburgh and pursued uh, my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences with full intention of returning back to industry um, once I completed my degree. After I completed my degree, I went to, um, I was offered a postdoctoral fellowship position in mucosal immunology, working in cancer vaccines and cancer immunology um, at the McGee Women's Research Institute. And um, so I joined the McGee Women's Research Institute as a postdoctoral fellow. And while I was at McGee, I also completed an executive um, master's in MBA. So, um, Armed with all of that and prepared to go back to industry, I really started getting interested in women's and global health research. 
And so as I was ending my, my postdoctoral fellowship and getting recruited back to industry, many of the people I were telling me, well, what, why are you, why do you want to work in women's health? Why do you want to work in global health? These are um, not important areas. Well, that really made me want to and desire to work in that area even more so. Um, so with that desire, um, I started to develop research projects in those areas and then reached out to um, the Pitt School of Pharmacy for a potential academic position. And I joined the Pitt Pharmacy School um, in 2000, so oh, 20 years now. And I started the pharmaceutics lab um, down at McGee, Wim McGee Women's Research Institute. And now we have a lab also in the Salt Pavilion. So that's a little bit about how we came to be. My goal in was to establish a translational lab where we could actually bring products from the bench to the cl clinic and have a focus in women's and infectious disease, women's health and, and infectious disease. So this is actually a picture of my laboratory here. Um, these are uh, the group of people that I, a couple people are missing here. Um, but this is obviously pre-COVID, this picture is from. Um, as I said, I work with a, a really great group of individuals with a large breadth of expertise. And um, really, they make coming to work and working in this field um, a lot more fun and really um, have taught me a lot um, as we transpire through each of our projects. Our laboratory, as I said, is a translational lab. So we take the handoff from the drug discovery person, and then we build that product all the way to the first in human studies. So the first thing we do with those drug products are what we call pre-formulation studies. Those pre-formulation studies tell us about the drug ability of that chemical entity and start to tell us what types of dosage forms and drug delivery systems are needed to get the drug to target. Once armed with that information, we can then do formulation development. This is where we develop the drug delivery systems that will be used. And then we have to make sure that those drug delivery systems that we've designed um, function the way that they're supposed to function. And we, and we do this through a series of formulation assessment work. Additionally, I can't let go of my engineering and my interest in scale-up. We, we also have an interest in the laboratory of scale-up activities because it's great if we can do it on the bench, but if we can't scale it up and get it into the clinic, it's never going to, to make it the next steps. So we have um, an emphasis on in scale-up activities. And then also some, um, as I said, mentioned, um, taking products to first in human studies our lab has so far transferred about 10 different products from the bench to the clinic. And those products range over types of drugs and drug formulations. So we've worked with small molecules, um, biologics, proteins, peptides, even viruses, bacteria, probiotics. So a range of active agents and also over a range of dosage forms. Our lab has the capability probably um, for to design just about every dosage form um, that we need that we we would desire to. We also have spanned our work. As I said, we have a focus in women's health and also a focus in infectious disease, but we've also um, developed products for other therapeutic areas, including areas like area irritable bowel disease, periodontal disease, some vaccine work and contraception. So really over a range of therapeutic areas. So what I wanna do with you today is just share two um, projects, two areas actually with you. The first is HIV prevention and the second is some of our work, more recent work in a COVID project. But let's talk first about the drug de development pipeline. So this is the, the cartoon that I um, found that actually demonstrates the drug development pipeline. It begins with the basic research um, which takes about three to six years. We then go through this translational, this is the world that we live in, the translational research. This is where the, the drug product development occurs. This is where the preclinical assessments occur. And actually in industry, they refer to this as the valley of death because this is usually um, where you get attrition of drug molecules. 
that can move forward to phase one. So for every 10,000 molecules that come into this pipeline, only one will ever make it to the market. So, so you get a large attrition and much of it happens in this valley of death. Um, once we get past this translational area, we then can enter into clinical trials. And um, through the clinical trial development, um, after clinical successful clinical trial development, you can then file for the F to the FDA for um, review and approval and marketing your product. This entire process takes about 12 to 16 years and costs about one or $2 billion. So very expensive and very timely process. What we've had to do in our laboratory is really squeeze both the budget and the timeline for many of the products that we've been developing. So we're trying to translate products from the bench to the clinic sometimes in, in less than four years. So let's talk first about um, some of our work in the HIV prevention area. So just some background on HIV prevention. HIV continues to be a global um, issue across, around the world. Um, new HIV infections, these are 2019 statistics um, from UNAIDS. There's about 1.7 million new infections and about 38 million people living with HIV. Importantly, a lot of the new infections that we're seeing are in younger people. So every week about 5,500 young women aged 15 to 24 become in fact newly infected with HIV. Women have been become the new face of the HIV epidemic. In parts of the world, women now account for um, greater than 50% of the new infections, specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the infection rates remain at the highest levels. Um, despite having 40 years of a fight against this virus and this, this pandemic, it still remains one of the leading causes of death in, women, in young women aged 15 to 44. So this is women of reproductive age. So, so there's really a need to develop a female controlled prevention product that women can use to pre prevent acquisition of HIV infection. So let's think about HIV infection for a moment. So HIV, for HIV to infect, you have to, a free virus enters the body, it then finds a host cell, it binds to that host cell, releases its genetic material, replicates that genetic material, buds off into new viruses. So if we think about prevention, what we need to do is we really need to stop this replication, this um, infection process within the very early stages. So we target either lysing the free virus, inhibiting fusion to the host cell, inhibiting the ability to, to um, replicate or to integrate its DNA into the host cell. Across that realm, our lab has collaborated with a number of other um, academic institutions as well as pharmaceutical companies with several different actives that span this range of potential active agents um, for, toward HIV prevention. So from prevention modality standpoint, you know, what is in our toolbox right now? What exists to prevent HIV infection out there? There's one FDA approved product, that's Trivada. That Trivada is an oral tablet that's taken daily it's a combination of tenofovir and emtricitabine. Um, this tablet was um, approved by the FDA for use. Unfortunately, because it's an, a daily oral regimen, there and it, additionally, it is also Truvada is also used for HIV therapy. So there's a, a stigma that's associated with its use. The uptake of Truvada, oral Truvada, as an HIV prevention preventative has been very slow. A second addition, additional product called Discovi, which is a, a prodrug, tenofovir alafenamide and emtricitabine combination has also been approved um, recently. But unfortunately, Discovi um, was not, is not approved currently for cis cisgender women. 
So you can see here the advantage of the SCOVI is a much smaller tablet. This is the SCOVI tablet versus the Truvada tablet. So, so the hopes is with um, the, the smaller tablet, more potent drug, that we would get improved compliance. Well, this is still yet to remain, but, but it's still not available for cisgender women, even if they want, opted to try to use this product. So what are the types of products that we can look to, to, to um, prevention? So if we think about HIV, most of the HIV infections occur by sexual transmission of, of, H of the virus. Um, so the goal is really to stop the virus at the point of entry. So many of the preventative tools that have been explored are products that are administered vaginally. So vaginal gels, inserts, rings, and films have all been looked at as potential products for um, HIV prevention. Additionally, injectable products and implants have also been explored as potential pre prevention modality. Hey, you At the end of Hello? I think someone needs to mute their speaker, please. So at the end of the day, the fact is, is that n no one product will really capture all women. So so what we really have understood now from many of the behavioral scientists is that we really need a toolbox of variety of options to provide to women. We do need something that is female controlled um, and something that can be discreetly used and can be used in all of the aspects of women's lives to protect them from acquisition. So to that end, I wanna talk about two specific products. Um, one is a ring product and the other is a film product. Um, starting with the Depivirine ring product, Depivirine is one of these antiretroviral drugs. Depivirine is what we call a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So what that means is it stops the virus from replicating. That's the target for this drug. It's a very potent drug and it's been shown to be a very safe drug. International Partnership for Microbicides has developed a intravaginal ring. The ring can be placed into the vagina. It releases the drug over a period of 30 days and provides protection against acquisition of HIV. There's been two large phase three trials, the ASPIRE and the RING trial um, that were conducted to show efficacy for this product. Currently, the status of the the Pivarine ring is that it has been approved by the European Medical Association and has also been pre-qualified for by the World Health Organization and at this time is undergoing FDA review as well as review by many of the countries in South Africa. Why, why are rings important? Um, a vaginal ring for HIV and pre prevention obviously is a discreet, it's a women controlled product. It can be used long acting. So it's a monthly product. So it only requires monthly insertion. It can be used privately. Um, generally partners are not aware of, of women's use of these products. And it's also um, been shown to be a very safe dosage for them. Another big reason is that women, some women are, are already familiar with this because of the vaginal ring contraceptive product. Now, what's our role in bringing this vaginal ring forward? Well, one of the hats that I also wear is as the um, principal investigator for the Microbicide Trials Network. Um, the Microbicide Trials Network is an international clinical trials network that's focused on HIV prevention. Um, it's led by Dr. Sharon Hillier, and we have our center here at the University of Pittsburgh. However, we have clinical sites all over the world. So we have a total of 25 clinical research sites. Many are in the parts of the world where the epidemic is, um, the HIV epidemic is, is at its worst. Um, to date, we have actually conducted clinical trials for HIV prevention in more than 16,000 research patients and have completed over 44 studies within the MTN um, microbicide trials network. 
Now, of those two studies that I said were key in bringing the ring forward, um, one of those studies, the ASPIRE trial, was done um, by the Microbicide Trials Network. It was conducted at four of our clinical sites in South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. What we found from that clinical data was, uh, as you would anticipate, women who used the product were more likely to be protected than women that did not. So what you see in this graph is this actually shows the amount of risk reduction as a function of adherence. So you can see that in those women that, real, that use the, the ring as, as prescribed, they actually were protect, had a 92% risk reduction with ring use. However, in those women that had low or no use, you had less than 20 or less than 10% of a risk reduction. So overall, the, the data for the ring ended up about between 30 and 40% of risk reduction um, for HIV acquisition. Further, what we learned is um, younger women tended not to be as compliant with ring use than older women. So among women that were 25 or older, um, we actually had higher levels of HIV prevention efficacy than we did for younger women. When we did a sub-analysis that was a planned sub-analysis, what we found was that many of the younger women were not um, using the ring as um, they were instructed to do so. So, so what that taught us was here we have a great product, a vaginal ring, and it will go forward and we're very excited. It will be the first female controlled um, HIV prevention product that's marketed in, in the world and especially in those parts of the world that need this product. Um, however, we've, all, we've also learned that not every woman, woman will use this product. So we know not everybody likes Coke, not everybody likes Pepsi, women want choices. And so our goal is to give women choices. So what, what we've done in our lab is we're trying, we're thinking out of the box and trying to think of creating options for women um, for HIV prevention. And so one option that we've been studying is using a vaginal film. A vaginal film is sort of similar to a, a Listerine strip. It's a thin polymeric film. Um, it's a very low and discrete platform. Um, the pack it requires no applicators, so the packaging is very small, portable. Um, there's no impact on innate factors or no toxicity associated with the product. Another big factor with the vaginal film is you can make these films at a very low unit cost. So thinking about the parts of the world that we need to get this product, having the cost as low as possible is extremely important. So what have we done? We've done work um, with our, not only our lab, but other institutions and, and organizations uh, across the country. We've actually developed several anti-HIV prevention products. We've brought them from prototype through in vitro studies, animal testing, scale up, and into phase one studies. The first of our films were a, product, a film product with depivirine, which is that active I just talked to you about and tenofovir, which is what the active in Travada. So these were made as separate um, film products. And these were designed to be quick dissolve products. So they were designed to be coitally dependent. So they would be administered just prior to sexual activity and would protect um, the woman for a period of up to 24 hours. In those phase one studies, what we found was the products were found to be safe. They were found to be acceptable. Also during those studies, we took a small biopsy after the woman used that product and we brought it to the lab and tried to challenge that biopsy with HIV. And what we found is those biopsies were not able to be infected um, that had been exposed to the drug product. So that gave us evidence that we had delivered adequate amounts of drug for protection. What we feedback we got back is we got a few women that came back and said, hey, well, I wish this would work for a whole weekend or for a week. So once again, trying to starting to dissect out to women that wanted a little bit longer times of protection. 
So toward that end, we move forward to develop a seven-day film um, with an integrase inhibitor. This is a MK2048 is an integrase inhibitor um, developed by Merck. And we developed a seven-day um, product. The film itself delivers drug over a period of seven days. And currently we are in um, phase one clinical trials evaluating all of these aspects with regard to the, the film. We're about a third of the way through the study. And so far we've had no, no um, safety issues at all with the product. Other, we've really expanded the technology with um, Dr. Vinyak Sant has worked on some nanopattern films to extend um, some of the retention in the vagina. We've combined it with nanoparticles and nanocrystals. Um, we've also worked on extrusion as well as 3D printing for alternative um, manufacturing processes for the films. And we've applied the film platform in a number of different areas. We've applied it um, for um, delivering probiotics. Um, probiotics such as lactobacillus can be used as a preventative for HIV and other uh, women's health issues. We've also done a study with the CDC to develop a measles vaccine um, using the film platform, as well as developed, um, we currently have a project called Latch that's developing a multi-purpose pre prevention technology where we're combining HIV prevention with um, contraception in, in a single product. And once again, this is again, responding to um, what women are asking for and what women want um, through our earlier clinical trials for HIV preventative products. So moving forward to um, the second topic I wanted to cover with you is some of the work with that we're doing in COVID prevention right now. Um, our work in COVID, we're actually working with a molecule called graficin. Graficin is actually a natural product. It was first isolated from red algae off the coast of New Zealand. Um, it's an antiviral protein, and it, it's been shown to have activity not only against HIV, but also against hepatitis, um, herpes, um, human papillomavirus, Ebola, knife, coronavirus, influenza, as well as several other viruses. It's been shown to be safe in vitro, in vivo, and in human safety uh, studies. Graficin's an entry inhibitor. So if we think about that HIV infection cycle, it's going to inhibit entry into, the, into the, an infection. So specifically, this is our HIV um, virus. Um, there's a glycoprotein GP120 and GP41 that specifically bind um, with graficin. Once graficin binds at that site, it makes it unable to infect the host cell. Now, one of the first things that had to, we had to overcome is this is a protein drug. Graficin is a protein drug. So how can we manufacture large quantities of graficin to do our clinical studies? Our collaborators at the University of Louisville have actually developed a method um, that utilizes tobacco plants um, to generate large amounts of the graficin in order to use this product for our clinical trials. So these tobacco plants are actually genetically modified and then they're harvested and the graficin is isolated um, from the tobacco plants. So where are we with uh, this product? The first product we actually developed was for HIV prevention. So we started working with um, graficin first as an HIV prevention product. When we were doing that, remember that pre-formulation stage that I told you we start off with where we're chemically characterizing to see if it can be a drug. Well, when we did these studies in our laboratory, we, we identified that it was very subject to oxidative degradation. So because of that, we had to make a modification of the graficin and we call that Q-graficin. So it's an analog that's um, more stable to oxidative degradation. Once we had stabilized our, act, our lead active, we then made some product formulations. We made formulations that were in the, the gel formulations as well as um, we made some film products, some tablet products, 
And ultimately, we um, had developed an enema product to um, protect from receptive anal intercourse, um, HIV infection that is, occurs through receptive anal intercourse. So this um, enema was developed by Lin Wong in my laboratory. And once Lin had this product developed, we then filed a pre-IND um, with the FDA. Uh, we then developed uh, an IRB pro pro uh, study protocol. And then we um, submitted our IND to the FDA. At that point, we were then allowed to start our HIV prevention phase one human study. Um, this was actually conducted under our Prevent U19 grant. This is an NIH grant that was um, funded by National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And the PI for that grant is actually our collaborator down at the University of Louisville, Kenneth Palmer. Um, this study was to be conducted in 21 volunteers. And we, at the point, um, we had enrolled three subjects that received active product in an open label arm, because this is the first time in humans, we had to show the FDA that we had some safety before they allowed us to continue on to the remainder of the subjects that were to be enrolled. So we had like a little safety check before we moved on to dose more subjects. We easily um, showed safety in that initial arm and then moved forward um, to complete the clinical trial. Unfortunately, before we completed the clinical trial, COVID hit. So the COVID pandemic um, came along, everything was shut down, but we were working on graficin. And if you remember when I went through, what are the names of some of the other viruses that graficin is active against? One that had demonstrated activity against was coronavirus. So graficin had been shown by not only Dr. Palmer at Louisville, but other groups as well as the National Cancer Institute to have activity against SARS-CoV-1 as well as MERS-CoV. And those studies had been done in both in vitro as well as animal studies to show its efficacy. Additionally, um, Dr. Palmer was able to obtain some of the first clinical strains from Seattle from CoV-2 and showed that the Q graficin molecule actually had very potent activity against SARS-CoV-2. So at that point, um, it became a goal of our group to actually develop a product that could be utilized to inhibit um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thinking about such a product, we decided that we wanted to develop a nasal spray product. And our rationale for why we wanted to develop a nasal spray product was because one of the points of ent first entry is through your mouth or your nose. And that's also a point of very high replication of the virus. So we wanted to target the virus again at entry and also where it's replicating most efficiently. And this is what was our rationale for development of our um, nasal spray product. So, so what we had is we had all the knowledge that we had from the development of the animal product. We had this safety data in humans. So we knew given rectally it was safe, but we didn't know about nasal specific aspects of the product. We also didn't know if it was gonna be safe when given nasally. So, so what we had to do was do some gap filling activities in our pre-formulation assessments. We had to obviously make a new product, a nasal product had to be developed and um, Lin Wong in my lab developed a nasal spray product. And once that product was developed, we then had to test it in in vitro studies for regard to nasal deposition. Elaine in the lab has done a lot of work with nasal deposition. Um, spray characterization, um, as well as in vitro efficacy and toxicity. This work was done by Kenneth Palmer's group, as well as um, Zintong Oliver in our laboratory has done this work. We also did some animal studies to show that the drug went to, it stayed in the area that we targeted the drug to go to. So we actually did some, this, this is a study where we labeled the drug product and then did some imaging studies to demonstrate 
that the drug product stayed, remained in the, at the target site in the nasal cavity. We went on to do IND enabling studies and safety studies in the, in, in the animal model and we're in the process of doing GMP manufacturing and human phase one studies. Um, this is uh, the picture of Lin Wong, who's done a lot of the formulation work um, for the, the QGRFT nasal spray. Uh, as I said, we've already prepared the pre-IND has been submitted to the FDA. We have, are in the process of going to submit the IND um, for the, this product. So, so those, that goes over two of the products. We have a lot of products. This is our team, once again, that we work on lots of exciting drug delivery products. This names a, a few of the different products that we have going on in the lab right now. Um, and just wanna leave you with a, a quote from one of the young women from one of our clinical studies. Um, this is from one of uh, a 15 year old at one of our clinical sites. And, she says, I don't want to die before I turn 25. I refuse to sit down and watch my generation fall into pieces. I'm going to make a difference, will you? Women are very um, emotional and, and very have a strong desire to protect themselves. And so we really are driven to help those women. And to, to make a point in the time, those young women that I say are dying, are getting infected in this uh, time that I've been talking to you to go over this work, 33 new infections have occurred um, with HIV. So there's really a, a strong need um, for us to work for these women to, to have products that can protect them. So I'll be happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Dr. Rohan. Uh, yes, as we said before, uh, please feel free to ask any questions now or in the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, we have a few questions that we received as well. Um, and I also just posted the link to the survey that we uh, request everyone to fill out. This will help us um, build on what we can improve on um, as we continue to move forward with these fireside chats. And I'll go ahead and ask our first question. Um, some of these might be a little bit redundant or um, something you already mentioned, but again, that's just um, feel free to, you know, add on details, whatever you'd like to do. So the first question was, what sparked your interest in dosage form research? So um, really, I guess my interest in dosage form research comes from my experiences at Sterling Drug. So the group that I was with, um, they called it novel drug delivery systems. But really what it was is anything that was challenging and or impossible came to our group. And, and so it really gave us a lot of very challenging products to work on, challenging um, on both the OTC as well as the prescription side. And so that having the breadth of opportunities within that group really sparked all of my desire to be, to really focus my career in drug delivery. Great. Another question is what common misconceptions do you see in how people handle HIV and HIV research in the public? So, so one common misconception is that HIV is not a problem anymore. So I think that a lot of people think that HIV has gone away, it's an old problem and it's, it's not really uh, a significant problem. But as you can see from some of the numbers, HIV continues to be a problem. And now it's continuing to take younger um, people from our lives. Another big thing that we face is the stigma associated with HIV infection. Um, we find barriers in women and, and across women and men who want to use HIV prevention products. They really, that stigma associated with fear of either partners or family members um, becoming aware of their um, desire to be protect themselves from HIV is a huge barrier for success and prevention.
Thank you. Another question we have is, how has COVID-19 sped up the pipeline for other therapies, kind of like what you mentioned with Griffiths and um, being used in the opposite way? Is there anything that maybe is coming up afterwards that was influenced by COVID-19 research that can be used in other therapies? I think COVID-19 research has been extraordinary and will really impact many fields, including the HIV field. At our HIV um, meeting this year, um, which Tony Fauci spoke at, you know, one of the big things he said was how much we have learned from COVID will advance much of what we're doing in HIV, especially in the HIV vaccine world. Um, much of the rapid advancement of RNA vaccines will really facilitate future work um, with HIV vaccines. And I see a question from someone asking, how can pre-pharmacy students get involved in your research? Um, just reach out to me and um, express your interest. Uh, don't hesitate to send me an email or reach out to anyone in our laboratory and express your interest in our research. There's um, summer programs. There's a summer college program at the McGee Women's Research Institute that is available on their site. There's um, opportunities during the school year, um, many opportunities. So just reach out to us and we'll help you to find ways to do that. So other than women's health and HIV, are there other therapeutic areas that you are interested in and may try to explore in the future? So, as I said, we, we're really interested by drug delivery challenges, and that is not isolated to any one therapeutic area. So, so we have done, we have had experience in areas um, outside of women's health, such as irritable bowel disease, uh, periodontal disease, as well as a number of other uh, areas for interest. When we Actually, when we first started the work, our work, we did a lot of cancer uh, chemotherapy work and gynecologic oncology product worked with gynecologic oncology. Our lab was actually the first to develop um, the lymphocytography colloids that are used um, for treatment of cervical cancer. Um, so we have a wide range. Dr. Patel in my lab is very interested in endometriosis. Um, we have a big... Uh, effort that we're working on right now that is an area of non-hormonal contraceptives. So still areas of women's health in, in some of those aspects, but um, different therapeutic areas for sure. I know you mentioned um, in your presentation about the choosing a different uh, dosage form, say for having options for, for patients. One question was, um, what special populations are targeted for say like the vaginal film dosage form relative to another population outside of just having options? So, so I, I get, I'm not sure I 100% understand, but I think if you're talking about one of the special populations we target for the film dosage form, as I mentioned, it has a very low cost. Um, so we're this, we see this as a platform that can be easily delivered and implemented into um, low income countries. Similarly, that's how our vaccine work with the measles with CDC came to play because many of the vaccine products require cold chain um, storage, which means that it has to remain cold from the time that it's shipped and stored. And as you can imagine, in parts of the world where we work, like Sub-Saharan Africa, that is just not possible or practical. So by using our film platform, we were able to develop a, a measles vaccine and also have done some work with yellow fever and rotavirus that also can be not require any cold chain. So that's another um, target for low middle income countries. 
Well, we, um, I don't have any more questions, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to ask Dr. Rogan now. Um, Marsha also posted Dr. Rogan's email, so you can contact her if you're thinking about something or if something up comes up later on. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank Dr. Rogan for uh, joining us again today. Um, I also see some members of Dr. Rogan's lab, um, so thank you all for joining today as well. Yeah, so if I can ask maybe the members of my lab who can put their um, video on to show your faces because um, this is all really your work that I'm standing here talking about. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. <laughs>